Aloha. 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 Okay, we'll do it one more time. Aloha. Aloha. It's a greeting. In Hawaiian, it means literally, may the spirit of the one true God be upon you. So it's a blessing. So, um, with that in mind, I'd like you to turn to somebody and just greet them with a big smile and then aloha. John, um, John really valued the Hawaiian culture and his family spent quite a lot of special time in Maui, my, my hometown, my, my dad's hometown of Lahaina. And so we were trying to Hawaiianize John. And the beautiful thing now is with John being in heaven, as we know perfection is, he's fully Hawaiian. <laughs> I have the honor and the privilege of being uh, John's pastor. I'm the pastor of Cascade Becoming Church in Vancouver, Washington. And the very first time I met John Kohlenberger, he came into our church, he sat in the back at the end of the service, he came up to me, he said, what is your view of women in ministry? He said, my view of women in ministry, I'm part of the Evangelical Covenant Church, and so I shared what that view was. And he said, no, what's your view? So I said, we have women on leadership. We, we value the wisdom and the insight of women. Leadership is a gift, and women fulfill those gifts. And if we were to be the pastor in the church, select, would want a woman pastor, we would have a woman pastor. So my wife came up to me and said, who was that man that was talking to you? Because John just came up and asked the question. I simply said, a cook with an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks later, John came up with some brochures. There was a conference for Christians for Biblical Equality. It was going to be held in Portland, and John was one of the keynote speakers, and so he asked if he could leave some of the brochures on the table. And so I said, sure. And so then I grabbed one of the brochures, because I wanted to find out who this guy was. And I looked at his name, and Kohlenberger, it, 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 it sounded familiar, but that's all it did. It sounded familiar. And so I went home and got online and, and got on the website for Christians for Biblical Equality, trying to find John's name, because John's, uh, John's name was nowhere to be found, unless I could find. So what's the next best thing you do? Google, right? So I Googled John's name. Boom! You know, biblical languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, all these things. Lists and lists and lists of John's accomplishments. And I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I went into the other room and I got my wife, Glenda, and I said, you need to see this. So she looked at the screen as we were both just like, she simply said, the kook is a genius. <laughs> kook, genius, worship leader, Sunday school teacher, the bass and guitar dude, confirmation teacher, preacher, mentor, friend, and some even called him Uncle John. Those were the titles that he had at our church. Those were some of the roles that Uncle John fulfilled in our church. Around the time John was diagnosed with his cancer, he, we had a conversation and he said, you know what I really am? I am a map maker. I am a map maker. I, I, I develop maps and I provide tools for people to navigate the vast richness and the openness of Scripture. And I help him get there. I am a map maker. And for me, that, that, that's very significant. And so that title, I add to that, because John was a map maker. He, he liked getting people to different places, places they'd never been to. And one of the things I think John really loved, and Carolyn brought this up, I think he loved when people had the aha moment. You know those moments when John teaches and shares, and you're just kind of like, oh. And I think he loved when people had the aha moment. But the beautiful thing about John was that he enjoyed taking people to those aha moments, but oh, did he love the aha moments himself, right? And maybe you remember seeing John um, in those aha moments. Those aha moments were the, just some hilarious movies sometimes, right? It's going to be a good movie, and he would be just, ah, ha, ha, ha. the guy laughed big. Because he loved those, uh, uh, those aha moments. And I think that says something about John, because we think, many think of John as a biblical scholar. But John wasn't only a teacher, John was a learner. And he would learn from people, and he was constantly learning. 
And so that's what I that's what I loved about John is that those aha experience. So I'm honored to be his pastor. Um, I never felt threatened, never felt um, intimidated. People said, John Kohlenberger goes to your church? He's just feeling terrible. I'm like, I actually know the dude just plays bass, you know? Because <laughs> John was that kind of a friend. John never criticized me. He would talk, you know, we'd kind of come off to the side and you know, maybe share some things, but he never criticized me. He never broke me down. He always lifted me up. And I, I'm so grateful for John. <laughs> For that encouragement and just lifting me up. And I think that was the other thing that John did for people in our church is just to kind of lift them up. People that were kind of trying to navigate. It was music my thing. He would encourage and lift them up in their music. We'd even have some young people in our church that decided they wanted to learn, you know, Greek and Hebrew. And John took, took them under their wings and, and, and lifted people up. John was completely dedicated to the life of our church. He, he was such an integral part of the church, and we could always count on John being there. He would sometimes have to go to some either a Zombie conference or a CBE conference, but he'd always tell me, I'm trying to get home Saturday night so I can be in worship. And so we just really value John's dedication and love for the church. I, I value John's understanding and respect for the, the office of pastor, and I feel so honored to have served with him. <clears throat> One of the things John says is, um, I came to Cascade View Covenant Church because of your tagline, a safe place to see God. And I wanted to find out if it was. And I think maybe we should have changed our tagline to a small church with a big brain. <laughs> that would be it. A small church with a big brain. One of the things, it, not only the aha moments and, and just encouragement and lifting up people. I think John, during the time he was at Cascade View Covenant Church, I think learned maybe deeply maybe more, maybe more intentionally, how to value relationships. John valued relationships. He didn't take relationships for granted. He didn't take people for granted. He was very careful. He was very careful because he, he knew. I remember one time that we were having a conversation. We were chatting later, and he says, you know, Jim, I'm learning. I could use my words, and I could have smothered that guy. I didn't want to do that. Because John started to value relationships in our church. And he valued all kinds of relationships. He, there was an article in our denominational, uh, their newsletter, um, the Covenant Companion that just came out. I found out I was speaking to the editor. And he said, you know, this is what intrigued me. That you have in your church a biblical scholar who values youth. That's interesting. And so they did an article about John and, and his connection with people. So John had come to, to value relationships. He valued relationships through serving on the worship team. He valued relationships in uh, confirmation and teaching our youth. He, he valued relationships in the teaching of Sunday school. He valued relationships even in preaching. And I loved it when John preached. But the one thing that was most valuable for John from the very moment he came to Cascade the Covenant Church was his ohana, his family. He loved his family. He loved his wife, Carolyn. He loved his children, Josh and Sarah. He loved his sister, Patty. And I think it was by God's graciousness that John was given 13 more short years. But I think also it was John's tenacity to make sure his family was taken care of. His tenacity to make sure that they were provided for. Because once Josh received that job that John was so proud that he got, he started to loosen up a little bit. So our relationships and his family was just this beautiful thing. His ohana, his ohana was very valuable for him. John, I'm going to close with a story with the worship team. As you know, John's mind just works incredibly fast, incredibly wacky. It's just incredible, right? And so, um, John had the worship team pick out three words. And so they gave John these three words. And John says, I will work these into the message. Because John was doing the story. He says, I will work these into the message seamlessly. And so the, the worship team, you know, so John's not preaching. Now the worship team's kind of like, I think John maybe did it to kind of make sure that the worship team was listening to his sermon. Maybe that's what he did to play around. So the worship team's kind of like, you know, just 
And so in Java, kind of use, you know, the curious message that, uh, 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 Barbie car, uh, you know, and, you know, people are just wanting to worship you, right? <laughs> and then, uh, uh, you know, I, I think Ron was saying that John said something about, you know, God, there's nothing bigger than God's toenails. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, that actually uses all three words. And he did it two or three times. Be like, hey, John, okay, we got the three words, okay? Three words. Yeah, I'd be like, hey, Jay, let John preach. Let John preach for a while. And so the John would come up with these three words. Well, it, it got so bad that my children found out about it. So they okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's these three words, three words, okay? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to go down that road. John, John's mind was a totally different things. I'm never going to do that. Come on, man, come on, man. So I've never, ever tried it. I'm never, ever going to try it. But three words right now. I'm not going to try to leave it in. I just want to say three words. Describing John. Complex. Beatles. Faithful. John was a very complex man. We know that. We know that by the relationships that he has here. Tom was sharing that, you know, look at all these people from different walks of life, different places. And why are we here? Because of one man, John. John, he was a complex person. We saw in our, uh, in our church the complexity of John, his willingness and how he taught and used it. I mean, he's the only guy that I've ever seen successfully tied Simpsons. And the Lord of the Rings and the Scriptures all together make it work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beatles, I don't need to say anything more. I mean, we would talk about music, and John was really solid at first. Be like, oh yeah, you know, um, Harry Nielsen, he's pretty good. Everybody says he's great, but you know, we don't know what John. You know, Paul practice. We know what John feels about the Beatles, right? Mm -hmm. John's good. Faithful as a friend. Faithful as a husband. Faithful as a dad. A sister. An uncle. A grandfather. John is faithful as a servant. And he did a very, very good job. And because of the great job he did, everybody said, Amen. Amen. At this time, we are going to hear different pieces of John's complex life. So the first person I would like to introduce or to invite up now is Dr. Stan Gundry. He's a senior vice president and publisher. Uh, uh, Jim has given me the permission to also add a little bit of it. I first met John in May of 1980. Actually, I met him and Ed Goodrick at the same time. I still remember the morning in May very well, because before we went inside for them to demonstrate to me what they were working on, we looked off in the distance and we could still see the smoke and the ash spewing out of Mount St. Helens. I've never forgotten that. That was the first time I met John. I was a neophyte in Christian publishing at Son of the Publishing House. And John was a brilliant yet young biblical scholar being mentored by Professor Edward W. Goodrich. John and I entered the publishing world together, and we grew in that world, I as his publisher, and he as my author. But over time, our relationship became one of deep friendship, and so I am very honored today to deliver this tribute to my friend. John's contributions to Christian publishing in general and his contributions to Bible publishing and Bible study reference tools in particular are without equal in this generation. John used to joke that he hoped he would not go crazy creating concordances as one of his predecessors had, namely Alexander Cruden the creator of Cruden's complete concordance to the King James Version of the Bible. But in the late 1970s, John and his mentor Ed did have a crazy idea that they successfully sold to Zonima. By combining their expert knowledge of the biblical languages with the newly emerging technologies enabled by computer hardware and software, 
They propose to create concordances for the newly published New International Version of the Bible more quickly, exhaustively, and accurately than ever before. Some people doubted that it could be done. In fact, I still remember a meeting in Ed's house in Portland where we all looked at one another and my boss, Bruce Reisman, was in the room and we looked to one of the computer guys from Control Data Corporation and we said, can John's proposal here work to really generate and typeset an exhaustive performance? And he said, I think so. It worked. 100 years earlier, it had taken Robert Young 40 years to manually create Young's analytical concordance. And a few years later, it took James Strong nearly 30 years to create Strong's exhaustive concordance to the Bible. Crazy though the idea was, with the help of computers, in seven years, John and Ed were able to complete the first edition of the NIV exhaustive concordance, a massive work of nearly 1,900 pages with over 556,000 lines of text. In the process, they replaced Strong's numbering system with a far more accurate numbering system. Known as the GK numbers, they assigned a number to the lexical or dictionary form of every Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek word in the manuscripts of the biblical languages. Then, they matched up every word of the NIV to the words of the biblical text in the original languages. And in so doing, they also indicated the exact nature of the relationship between the words of the NIV and the words of the original text. No one had ever before created an exhaustive Bible concordance with such care, precision, and accuracy. And that was uh, published originally, I believe, in 1990. All these many years later, I'm not aware of a single mistake that anyone has found in the Goodrick Kohlenberger numbering system. The NIV Exhaustive Concordance was the crowning achievement of Ed and John. But while Ed was working on the computer, compiling the database from which the New Testament portion of the Exhaustive Concordance would be generated, John created and typeset a Cruden's type concordance to the NIV, as well as other smaller concordances that were published for the NIV, including all of the court concordances that are still featured in the back of the NIV Bibles. And for good measure, he created the cross-reference system that is also still used in NIV Bibles, again, assisted by computer technology. So if you have an NIV Bible with an importance in the back, it was John Kohlenberger who created that. If you have an NIV Bible that has center column or in the margins cross-references, that was John Kohlenberger who created that. After the death of his mentor, Ed Goodrick, John carried on the work that the two had begun together. He continued to refine the database from which the exhaustive concordance had been created, and he single-handedly updated that database to the edition of the NIV published in 2011. And from the updated database, John created and typeset the NIV Exhaustive Concordance third edition published just six months before his death. John's most recent contribution to biblical studies was in designing and typesetting the NIV portion of the Greek English New Testament, the United Bible Society Fifth Revised Edition and the New International Version, a joint publication of the German Bible Society and Zondheim, and it was released from our warehouse just two days ago. But these achievements merely scratched the surface of John's work. He created the interlinear NIV Hebrew English Old Testament, Hebrew English and Greek English concordances, 
and unabridged concordance to the new revised standard version, a revised and corrected version of the strong typeset scores of Bibles for Zondervan and other Bible publishers. Had Ed Goodrick lived longer, he would have been proud of John because John took what Ed taught him and he surpassed Ed's own achievements. John never went on for PhD work, but honestly, I think it's just as well he did not. Most of it would have been redundant to what John had already learned and done. In fact, in my book, John did the equivalent of PhD work several times over. I have often said that what James Strong was to the King James Version in creating the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, John Kohlenberger was to the New International Version, although John was able to accomplish even more than the great James Strong because of the tools that were available to John. John should be remembered for his contribution to the success of the NIV, for his contribution to Bible publishing in general, and for his desire to make Bible study reference tools that were accessible to students who did not have an advanced knowledge of the biblical languages. I grieve the loss of a close friend and publishing colleague, but I am grateful for the rich legacy of tools for Bible study that he has left behind. Now I can't resist one more personal note. Pastor Jim uh, mentioned uh, uh, the question that John asked him that first Sunday evening, I guess it was, about uh, women and their participation in the church. Well, there's a story behind that that not too many people know. Um, I've been known for, since 19, mid-1970s, as a biblical egalitarian. And at one time, somewhat controversial in that regard. John, in the early days of our acquaintance, uh, treated me with some distance on that topic. I could tell he wanted to talk about it, but uh, on the other hand, he didn't. So I decided just to wait for John to ask the question. And finally, John, one day when I was out here in Portland visiting with him, Stan, why is it that you don't think there should be any gender restrictions for women in ministry? Why do you believe that the biblical model for husbands and wives is one of mutual submission and equality. And I said, well, John, I have a policy. I never argue with people about that topic. However, I am willing to tell you my story. And I told him the story of how over time I had studied the subject and what arguments and considerations persuaded me that what made the most sense of all of the biblical evidence of Scripture was what is commonly known as a biblical egalitarian position. And then I closed and I said, John, just think about it. I think it was about five or six months later, years later uh, five or six months later, he called me on the phone and said, well, I've been thinking about it. I agree with you. <laughs> Don and I work as Christians in Biblical Equality's president, and I am just so honored to um, be part of this service. But John Colmer is quite possibly the most talented person I have ever known, and I first met him at the Evangelical Theological Society Convention. And I remember feeling really proud that I met Carolyn before I had met John. Um, on the phone, we had several lively conversations, and it was hard to say goodbye to her because we had so much to share. But I did meet John first at the Evangelical Theological Society, and because women comprise only less than 7% in the ATS, I was accustomed to encountering men who seemed wildly uncomfortable around women. <laughs> so you can imagine my surprise when 
This youngish scholar bounces into CBE's exhibit hall and says, my name's John Kohlenberger. I think you know my wife, Carolyn. I'd like to speak with you for a few brief moments. I want to tell you why I'm an egalitarian. <laughs> Those brief moments were really four hours later. <laughs> we all know John, right? <laughs> And for the next four hours, John and I covered many topics, Lord of the Rings, Beatles, <laughs> personal and professional concerns. And he explained to me, and of course he told me the story, Stan, that you shared. He talked extensively about his wife and why she is an egalitarian, and he held those, um, he held your thinking very dear. And as he carried on, I began to see that this man was driven by a concern for a fairness and an accurate treatment of the Bible. He loved the Bible. And he had a deep devotion to serving God's people, especially when it concerned gender and power. He was aware of the power differential and how that impacts women. And really, in all of my encounters with the ETS, my husband says, me, I've told you a million times not to exaggerate, but in all of my encounters with the ETS and the Greater Evangelical Academy, I truly, rarely have witnessed such a deep commitment to responsible scholarship as a means of serving the church. John presents, presented this extraordinary sense of accountability for the gifts and opportunities afforded him and he had a passion to make the most of it, to equip readers to embrace God's message of love bursting on the pages of the Bible. <coughs> now, near the end of our first conversation, I asked John to consider writing and speaking about these concerns for CBE, which he did. And within a few years, John did join the CBE Board of Directors. Why, Jim, you couldn't find his name, it's beyond me. Um, <coughs> He very much shaped our language and our vision for 15 years. In 2002, we scheduled a conference here in Portland so that John would, people would have huge access to him. I felt guilty about this because he was basically up on the docket all the time. I was like, how's this man ever going to go to the bathroom? He was so busy. But the week of the conference, John was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. And treatment began the very day we launched our conference. And yet, in John, really, cancer met a formidable foe. Not only in John, but in the community that loved him. And CBD members rallied together. We started fasting and praying as John continued his treatment and his work in his advocacy for biblical gender equality. And at the top of John's egalitarian projects, as I alluded to, was his interest in accuracy with respect to Bible translation. He was particularly, um, one priority for him was to challenge exclusive male language. And he uh, told me that he, I mean, he published a, an article about that later, and many of his articles are out here for you to help yourself to. He re uh, remembered the moment that he and his daughter Sarah, when she was eight years old, uh, Sarah apparently came up to John and said, why, Daddy, does God love boys more than girls? And she said, because the Bible talks about God wanting all men to be saved. And John assured Sarah that God loves boys and girls equally. And from that conversation on, where John was intentional about using gender accuracy, accurate language referring to both males and females, helping us all to understand how much God loves and includes us. And in a world obsessed with titles and power, John always stood with the marginalized. He was quick to observe that leadership in service is, leadership in scripture is about service, and he said everyone can serve. I remember him laughing once, saying, have you ever read a bestseller or attended a conference about becoming a servant or a slave for Jesus? We all want to be leaders. How many of us understand that leadership is about service? And John believed that sacrificial service was at the heart of the New Testament, and its practice is the best way to emulate the life and teachings of Christ. 
Paul encouraged all Christians to submit to one another in Ephesians 5.21. And likewise, John firmly believed that all Christians should submit themselves, at the very least, to the biblical text, serving its intention and true meaning faithfully. John was convinced that Christians are called to daily removing the presumptions and biases that distort scripture. And for this reason, John was enormously distressed as evangelicals developed a hierarchical reading of the Trinity in order to defend male authority. And I remember how excited he was to meet Kevin Giles, who was among the first to challenge this theologically. And the two of them were very hard to separate. And despite uh, John's disagreement with fellow evangelicals, truly I never heard him make a disparaging comment about another Christian. He was committed to the unity of Christian faith, and I just so respect that. In CBE, John found a community of scholars and leaders devoted to helping Christians discern the difference between the moral teachings of the Bible and Bible culture, the patriarchy of Bible culture. And though John, you know, he loved this lively, lively exchange of ideas, theological ideas, justice ideas, I believe he was truly concerned about the real life consequences of our theological formation. He was concerned about the importing of male hierarchy as a biblical ideal around the world. Though he published these amazing Bible reference tools that line the shelves, Christians around the world, he did have an extraordinary capacity to write lucidly for everyone, for the non-scholar and the scholar. His work was published in our journals and were recognized by the Evangelical Publishing Association for his tight logic and his accessibility. Again, he graciously devoted his talents to everyone. And though, I have to say, justice work, as all of you know, and gospel work is very challenging, and John was serious about that work, he always kept us laughing. I don't know how he did it. He kept us laughing, reminding us that God would carry the day. In him, we had a brilliant mind, a servant heart, and a true friend. His many talents were surpassed by his humility and his sense of responsibility in serving all of us, especially those who are outliers and outsiders. He inspired and equipped Christians around the globe with his clarity and his genius. And words are really just too thin, too thin to adequately express my thankfulness and privilege for having him as a colleague and a friend. Thank you. Two things stand like stone. Kindness and another's trouble courage in our own. Thus reads a plaque that adorns John and Carolyn Kohlenberger's names and adorns the consultation room on the seventh floor of Providence Cancer Center, a place that over the course of a decade became like family to John. It is an honor to be here today to represent that family. The quote on that plaque is perfect because to me John exemplified kindness and courage. Kindness. John said he felt a spiritual presence at Providence that was powerful and made him want to help us with our cancer research programs. And help he did in many, many ways. He donated books to our chapel library. He supported prostate cancer research through charitable gifts. He brought his family and friends to tour the cancer research labs and invited them to consider their own gifts. In 2011, he spoke to, at our biggest fundraising event of the year, our Creating Hope Cancer Luncheon, and shared his personal, very personal and spiritual journey with more than 800 strangers in the room that day. The next year, in 2012, he met former trailblazer Bill Walton and impacted this seven-footer so much that Bill kept referring to John and Ella the next day during his speech at the 2012 Cancer Luncheon. <clears throat> and like kindness, John exemplified courage. At Providence Cancer Center, we focus on immunotherapy, and that is harnessing our own immune system in the fight against cancer. We've been at this since 1993, when Dr. Walter Erba came to us from the National Cancer Institute. Back in 1993, he always believed the immune system played a role. 
But other places, not so much. There were only a handful of researchers focusing on that at the time. And we spent years trying to make a case, doing the hard work, um, showing that the immune system really can be that way in the height. So we've got a lab, and we've got brilliant scientists, and I'm going to get to introduce one of them momentarily. And we have an MD oncologists working in the fight, and they work together to translate ideas into patients. We couldn't do this important research without patients. We couldn't make the strides in the way we treat cancer without patients who have the courage to say, yes, I'll be first. I'll be first to try something. And I want to share a little statistic. Nationally, most adult cancer patients don't do clinical trials. In fact, less than 5% of current adult cancer patients are in any kind of clinical trial. At Providence Cancer Center, almost 20% of our adult cancer patients are on some form of clinical trial. And our scientists and MDs applaud people like John who said, yes, I'll try it. So in addition to participating in uh, novel immunotherapy trials, um, some were first in Oregon and some were even first in the world. He had a great oncologist, Dr. Brendan Curdy, who couldn't be here with us today, but I want to read a letter that Dr. Curdy wrote in tribute to John. John Kohlenberger came to Providence for the first time on September 17, 2004. He had been told before visiting our cancer center that his prostate cancer was advanced and that he needed to get his affairs in order. But John had much work to do and so did we. Over 11 years that since that initial visit, he received six experimental treatments as well as multiple standard ones to slow the progress of his cancer. There were many office visits and symptoms from the cancer treatments, but also, thankfully, quality time for family trips to Hawaii, electric guitar sessions, and the Bible scholarship for which John was renowned. Although I did not know this when I first met John, I came to appreciate over time that we were both translational researchers. His work involved applying new technologies to ancient biblical languages to identify concordances in the Bible. His innovative thinking about language and technology provided a foundation for many other scholars. What was behind his work was a search for meaning and truth. Cancer research also involves translation. We translate ideas in the lab into a clinical language that we hope will help our patients. But we too look for concordances. Connections to what we have learned in the lab, informed by what we have observed in the clinic. Doing this sort of work is also a search for truth. And when a deeper truth is found, a better treatment can be offered to our patients. John's curious and incisive mind led to many in-depth conversations about how his treatments worked, how the research studies were designed, and tours of the lab. Although he was a renowned Bible scholar, I think he could have held his own as an immunotherapy researcher. He served as an inspiration to many of our clinic staff, scientists, patients, and the Portland community as a speaker at our Cancer Center luncheon and many other venues. It was a great pleasure and privilege to care for John and to know him and his family. He inspired us with his faith and his search for truth. We owe a debt of gratitude to him for his friendship, support to many patients at Providence, and his contributions to research. Signed, Brendan Curdy, MD, Director of Translational Research at Providence Cancer Center. So, it also takes courage to dream in the face of cancer. At Providence, we were honored to be part of helping John achieve several of those dreams. First of all, he told us years ago he never thought he would see 60. He never thought he would become a grandfather and get to meet his own grandchildren. He never thought he would see Sarah start her own counseling practice or Josh finish pharmacy school and land his first job. And he never stopped believing that our world would one day finish cancer. We won't quit, John. As long as lives like yours continue to be cut short, we won't stop working. You made a tremendous difference in our fight. You were a great friend to me and to all of us, and we will never forget you. And I want to introduce one right now on our team who also won't quit. Dr. Bernie Fox is here. He's not in the program, but I want to invite him up. He's the Harder Family Chair and Laboratory Chief at Providence Cancer Center. It's really a great honor to be here. I think I, when I met John more than a decade ago, when he went on with the experimental therapies that had been developed really in the East Coast in Boston, it was a drug called GVAX, and I've been working on GVAX 
to a certain kind of cancer vaccine for about 25 years. And so we continue to tweak it and do things with it. And, and uh, so many of the things that we've heard about John that Pastor Jim said, I, I made a couple notes, and I think I'm just going to go through those. Um, I think one, as a researcher himself, and I knew, I, I did not know the scope, fully the scope, until uh, Sherry came by one day and, and told me John was looking for me because he had a copy of this, this book that he wanted to give me. And, and, um, and, and so I looked at the book that Sherry had gotten and I went back and looked at it. And I'm, I'm Catholic. I was in a seminary and I studied the uh, Bible for a while. One of my best friends is the director of the Theological College at Catholic University in Washington. And, you know, I sent it off to him. And I got all this stuff back. You know, this guy, you know, it's literally pretty impressive. Uh, um, so I thought it was pretty good. But I think it was his research background that he knew that new things were happening everywhere, right? In every technology in every space. And he knew enough to look a little bit in, into science and realize, well, how are you going to find those people that are doing this kind of research? And I think that led him to Brendan Kirby. Uh, Dr. Kurdi, who also trained in the National Cancer Institute, and myself and Dr. Urban, um, are really dedicated to moving therapies from the bench, from the research area, into patients. It's such a critical point, and often that's, that doesn't move anywhere near as fast as we want because we can't find the patients that are going to go on those trials. And, and, and so John, um, I think that word tenacity, he had the tenacity not just to go on that first trial, but to come back and realize that research is an evolving process, continues to evolve, continues generally to improve. And so we had the tenacity to go back and search for trials. And then when there weren't things available, say, well, when are you going to get something else? I mean, when's the next thing for me? I mean, and it wasn't just for John, it was for the field. It was for other people with cancer. And um, I, 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 uh, I was watching television, told me it's hard to, to miss this, I think, that television. I don't see a lot of TV, but there was, a, uh, there was an advertisement that talks about uh, Optivo, which was recently approved by the FDA for lung cancer, which is the number one cancer killer on the planet. And it goes, a chance for a longer life. And, and I think that is what a lot of us are trying to do, and it's just been that whole area that uh, Sherry Scales had talked about a minute ago, that's all new. That, that's technology that was not available to the general public uh, two, three years ago. But it's been accessible to people like John almost for the last decade because those drugs have been developed and we've participated in the development of those drugs which are finally, finally starting to make a difference in people. And I think John's really benefited, I think, from those technologies, but you never know for sure. It's only in controlled clinical trials so you can only figure that out. He was a believer, another word I heard catch up. He was a believer in people. He was a believer, uh, he was a believer in the scientists, the crazies, the, uh, the, the kook. Uh, I, think, uh, I think I'm clearly a kook. Uh, and I think John may have seen that in me um, because we're, we're, we're kind of going up against a wall often that is a wall that most people don't think you can get over. I mean, it's, it's something uh, that is, uh, it's, it's not going to be an easy thing to do, and you're going to spend a lot of time on it, and you may not succeed. But if you believe that, you'll never take that first step. And I think uh, John realized that. Um, that may, map maker idea that you, that you raised, I think in that way, in the way I think about research, John was clearly a map maker there too, because he was helping people get to places they had not been in the terms of cancer research and experimental therapies for patients with cancer. And thinking about the egalitarianism, my wife was the one that hit me with that. She's sitting next to me, she said, that man maker, that's what John was. I said, yeah, clearly. That's why I had to include that as well. I think the words responsibility and inspire are two other words that John felt. I think while it was, he clearly wanted, I think as, as all would, you know, something to help him but he realized that it was only in, in working and going in these clinical trials that he could help other people as well. And, and he inspired people. I think you have people, no, I have to, if you go to the, the Facebook video that is part of the Providence Cancer Center and talks about John, Carolyn, and Sarah, um, if you see the lab part of the video, that's, that's my research lab, and, and the people that are working in those studs are 
Dr. Sean Jensen is the one that's up front, but they've been studying GVAX and some of the vaccine strategies that, that John's been working on for not as long as I have, but uh, for more than the last decade. And, uh, and that is where they, the St. Hoods are where we developed a new therapy that John was the first person to get uh, with prostate cancer anywhere in the world uh, not too long ago as we tried to do something else to, to, to stop and battle the disease that he had. So I think I'll end there, but it's that inspiration. He's done so much to inspire so many coming to, uh, on the, in the research community uh, here in town, to come to the research center, to participate, to stop by and see us when he was coming by for treatments, um, but also to participate in things like the cancer luncheon where he um, hit myself and hit Andy Weinberg, my colleague who developed this drug Ox 40, which John was never able to get. But he hit us to say, you gotta do more, you know? And, and, and we realize that, but it's, it's make, good to make that personal connection with people. And the personal connection he made with me, I'm sure he made, I can tell from the other stories I've heard, he's made those connections with other people, pushing them to be better and to help the community move forward. So thank you very much. So I think most of you know who I am. I'm Sarah, John's daughter. I'm also the one that's been avoiding all of you as you were coming in today, saying, don't talk to me yet. I have to get through my talk before I start crying. Um, as I was listening to everyone say these great, wonderful things about my dad, I was also thinking about how Josh and I grew up so differently with an impression of him. We just we weren't so impressed with him in that way. <laughs> He was our dad. He, he was hilarious. Josh just reminded me that um, when we were younger, we had bunk beds, and he would sneak out in the backyard and pretend that he was a gooba monster or something until one day we caught him. And then we'd ask him to do it, but I don't think he wanted to anymore because we figured it out. Um, I was thinking in the last couple of weeks how... I keep hearing his voice in my head. And then I think, well, we all had plenty of opportunity to hear him talk, so that's no surprise. He could talk and talk and talk. But in such a good way, um, when I think that, oh, I should call Dad and tell him about this, I kind of already know what he was going to say or the noise he was going to make um, the, uh, or some kind of joke. <laughs> Uh, we called our dad a lot, both my brother and I. We all live within five, six miles of each other, my parents, my brother and his family, and me. But we always managed to be on the phone. And my dad, in the last five, six years, was convinced that Josh and I had a conspiracy going where one of us would call, and then the other one would wait for like 30 seconds, and then would call. And so, pretty much within a minute of a phone call, it was pretty likely I would hear, oh, okay, this has got to be your brother. Do you guys plan this? And we told it over and over, we don't plan it. Um, but I don't know if he ever did believe us. And because he could not let the call go, he would have to say, well, I know you're okay, so let me answer and see if Josh is okay, and then I'll call you back. <laughs> And then I said, well, you don't have to. And then two minutes later, he's like, yeah, Josh is okay. He just wanted to tell me about this thing that I should watch, this new movie trailer. And I was like, well, I was pretty much done too. Oh, okay. Um, and that could either end the call or we could be on for another hour um, <laughs> when he thought of other things he might want to tell me. I was thinking about, besides having his voice in my head, how when I was younger, um, that's how I'd always find him when he would be chatting away with people after church services, is I would just stop and listen, and pretty soon I could make out my dad's voice <laughs> amongst all the other chatter because his voice was so distinct. Um, it's awesome to hear how great his work was and how much it has done. I have to smile a little when we talk about how serious he was about his work. Because yes, he was serious, but when Josh and I were working with him, Josh did a lot more than I did, but for a while, both Josh and I worked with helping him. Um, he would say, okay guys, you really need to pay attention. 
This is where this column goes. If you lose this flow, this happens. On and on and on. And we'd be like, okay, hey, we're listening. And then all of a sudden, he would pull out his penny whistle and start playing the song. Like, <laughs> and we're looking at him like, Dad, what? Just <laughs> Same thing when uh, Skype came out and he and my brother were able to communicate in that way. And I was over there once and Josh goes, watch, I bet Dad's gonna do this thing. And sure enough, Dad was saying, so then you want to go over, you know, to this book of the Bible, and he turns himself into a shark. So he's talking as, you know, just his face on a shark's body on Skype, saying, now don't forget to check the cross-references, and Josh and I are just busting up, so. He did do great work, but clearly he needed his breaks and his sense of humor to get through it. Um, he was his own worst critic. Uh, I think all of you have heard over the years um, him talk about how he wished he had done better in his marriage, in his parenting, and just with reaching out to people, with being kind. And he just never quite got it. As smart as he was, he never got it. <laughs> that he made up like tenfold for all that. <laughs> That's why Paul's here, so make me not do that. <laughs> so I think I just kind of uh, wanted to end with that for all the writing that he did and all the publishing, I just feel that he rewrote um, his story that he regretted from his early life. I feel he rewrote it through the way he lived, and to me that's uh, his best accomplishment. and persevering to the end, and we can confidently say that he did stay strong to the end. He persevered to the end, and we love you, John. We miss you. This is very good.
says, you know, Dad isn't incredible. And I got to uh, read it to John. She says, Dad isn't incredible. John spent his entire career studying about all these people in the Bible. And pretty soon he gets to hang around with his old friends. <laughs> we talked about how smart and how sharp and how uh, a scholarly and educational John is. And just this incredible mind. And what he did with the scriptures. But the beautiful thing to remember, it wasn't what John knew. It was the fact that he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he lived it out. And he lived it out. And we're thankful for that. Thank you, Carol, Sarah, Josh, Abby. Time after time. Well, behind a great coup and genius is a wonderful family. And John, on many, many occasions, reminded me how much you made him a better husband and a better dad. So thank you. Thank you for investing in his life. Thank you for sharing him with us. We will continue to pray for you as you discover this new normal. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, Sarah Jr. Heavenly Father, we lift up the voices of the prayers that have been lifted up by voices, Lord. But we also lift up to you the prayers that are spoken from the heart. We thank you, Lord, for John's life and for how his life touched ours and made it just a little bit better. We thank you for the legacy that he leaves behind the wonderful work that will continue to guide people for generations and generations to come as they navigate your holy word. The Lord, most of all, we thank you for the legacy of his family and the behind the stories, the, the laughter. We thank you for Carolyn, Sarah, Josh, and Sarah Judy, and Patty. We thank you for the encouragement and the fight that they fought with you standing by your side for 13 years to encourage to cheer them on. Thank you for their tenacity as well to encourage our brother. The Lord, we also thank you for our brother who has demonstrated the importance of loving Jesus and being Jesus' father. And so we thank you, Father, that he has fought the good fight. He's run the race. And he gets to see what it was all about. So we thank you for that, Father. We ask that your anointing and your peace would be upon the, the Kohlenberg family. And that word John keeps reminding us, shalom, that wholeness that comes from knowing you. May this family in this time of brokenness emerge with shalom. And they can experience the fullness of your grace and your love and your peace. That you're going to be upon this wonderful and beautiful family. And I pray for a special prayer and anointing as well for John's friends that have known him for many, many, many years. And the hold that he leaves behind, Father, walk with his friends during this time of grief. We thank you so much, Father, that you are present with us. And that you will walk through us through this new normal. Praise the saints in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Let me just close with a statement from our brother Paul from Ephesians. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family, every Ohana in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can all ask or imagine according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in his peace. But I think before we leave, a round of applause to a man who's run the race and finished well. Right? Is there going to be a, we'll have a reception out? Okay, so how about this? Um, I'm going to dismiss the family, and they're going to kind of go back there and set up. I'm going to invite Lori. Lori? Lori, where are you? Woo-hoo! Lori Blair and John, they used to, uh, what, dueling guitars and keyboards. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Lori could probably tell you more about that, but what more? What more blessed way to celebrate John's life and um, Lori playing some Beatles songs. So we're gonna hear some Beatles songs. So um, as soon as the family um, uh, makes their way out back, um, we're gonna just have Lori playing. And then how about I, I'll dismiss you when I see them do that. Oh, and again, on behalf of the family, thank you very, very much um, for your participation in making this uh, sort of special. There's um, snacks in the back, there's cookie and waters. Um, connect with some people, share some John stories, because I know there's a lot out there to be told. Uh, but again, thank you, mahalo.